part two. Michael and I have had an ongoing conversation for seven, nine months now, almost a year, about, about data. And you know, in my position at the Filecoin Foundation, I've been in working with this ecosystem for close to two years now. And the biggest question I ask myself is, why? Why decentralized storage? Why verification, immutability? And it's a very difficult question because ultimately what we're trying to do is to get people to see the potential and value within a decentralized storage ecosystem in Filecoin. And where I've landed, thanks to Michael's help, is on, data, on the value of data itself. And it's something that we all know to be intimately true, but we don't know what to do with this knowledge of data and its value. So I invited Michael here to talk with me and to talk with you all about data, its value, and what that means going forward. So Michael, welcome to the stage. It's good to see you in real life as always. 3D. 3D. Uh, I know this is such a big topic and it can be overwhelming on where to start with people who are new to trying to understand the value of data. So what do you say to people who are trying to just get their arms around what, what's going on? So I think part of it is I think we've also lost the understanding of what data actually is. Um, because actually data, we've, we've got to the point where we see data as a transaction now, which is part of the problem. Data actually is someone's stories. It's someone's memories. It's their experiences. And we've lost sight of that completely. And even to the point where most organizations don't even understand the value of what they have. So as we've transitioned through the digital age, what data is, is, is lost its meaning and it's got a bit fuzzy. And we have generations now that don't know any different in terms of giving their data away because they don't intrinsically know the value of it. So there's only AI now that's kind of exposed data to us in its importance. And I think it's now we're having the right conversations around, well, what is the value of this thing? And I think that's, you bring up AI, and AI is everywhere in the landscape today, especially in technology. But let's start with that premise, because I think the value conversation or, mm. uh, around data has really come to the forefront because of AI. Yeah. So let's dive into, like, what, what are your thoughts on AI and how it's changed the landscape? So anybody that knows more about AI than probably me knows that AI is not new. It's 1950s. It's just evolved to the point where it's in the public domain now. So everybody knows about it. It's like, you know when you're trying to buy a red car and suddenly you see a red car everywhere? That's kind of AI today. Whereas AI has been in the background since 2003 on the internet, scraping data, learning, and producing algorithms. I think the way we see it today now is in everybody's conversation because it's now become a business conversation. It's a commercial conversation. But it's also now a public conversation because now we've reached new levels of, well, what does this mean for trust, right? What does this mean for all of these things? So everybody now is circling in on data because those things are now more visible. So AI has changed things, not in terms of the way that it's operating, it's just it's more visible. It's almost like it's reflecting back at us now to say, well, okay, we did all this 10 years ago, but now there's a land grab because now this has become such an important component of what people see the next level of business, to be honest. Yeah, and I do think, I, I look at like the New York Times versus OpenAI case. I know it's a popular one. And regardless of the outcome of that case, mm. I think it's forced a lot of businesses to say, well, I'm going, I don't want my uh, IP to be scraped off the internet, so I'm going to protect it. Yeah. And the only reason they do that is because it's, it's really making a, a statement about value. Mm. Uh, and then there's the other side of the spectrum, which is the individual. Yes. Us per participating on social media, uh, basically giving our behavioral patterns away for free <laughs> where it's being monetized. So you have like the business side of the conversation, which uh, let's call the New York Times Open AI case a great example of that. And then you have the individual. How do you begin to explain on both sides of the spectrum what's going on and, you know, how that relates to the value conversation. So most of the value conversations I have is going back to what is intrinsic versus extrinsic value. Okay. So what is the intrinsic value to you personally for that data? Because the intrinsic value to a business is very different to you as an individual. Um, to an individual, it could be the cultural heritage of that data. It could be the importance of that data. To a business, its intrinsic value could be the performance value of that data inside the business itself. Most struggle there, and that's why we have so much storage in the world. Right, because people don't intrinsically understand the data that they keep in their databases. So I'll give you some stats. I'm cheating now before my presentation, but a lot of people will tell you 90% of the world's data was created in the last four years, which is true. 80% of the internet is duplicated. 
right? That is a fact, yeah? Um, $30 billion of software is, is, that's how much is spent on a new software in the world. Most companies have 367 systems on average, right? And 97% of health data in all the world is not used. So we intrinsically do not understand the asset that's driving our business because we're so focused on the software and the technology. So this is like AI is a great catalyst for us to take a step back and say, well, actually, how do we get the best from AI is actually understanding the intrinsic value of the data that we all hold. Now, we are, we're up here talking about the value of data. And this is not something that many organizations have practiced. Mm. It's a skill set. How do you begin to start having a conversation of what is this worth? So I typically, when I do this, I work with companies almost like a per use case basis. Because as you can imagine, I worked with a company last week that has 75 years worth. They're, that's how old they are, that's how much data is kicking around their company. If I just went in there and said, what's the value of this? We'll be there until another 75 years because I'll never find the value. The way we do it with those guys is we just do it one intent at a time, one use case at a time, assign the data to the use case and then start unpacking value slowly. Um, you have to involve all parts of the business that intrinsically understand the value of what's being done. You can't do this isolated, because that's the other problem in businesses over time, they become silos, um, which is unfortunately a byproduct of the misunderstanding of data, because technology has been siloed, as is the data, so you have interoperability problems, data that isn't even portable. Um, so you have to tackle it one piece at a time, and you start understanding value as you go. You can't do it in one go, it's physically impossible. Right. I mean. Ideally, what people want to go is they want to go to eBay, put their little, you know, their serial ID number in an eBay machine, and say, "What is this worth?" Mm. And I know it's not that simple, but uh, like, what? That's the fast path. Mm. But when you're working on these consultative arrangements, mm. how much time do you get to per use case on? understanding, okay, what is it that they have? So we try and get them through really fast cycles. So typically anybody that's trying, most of the, most of the conversations today are around I want to do AI, which is no surprise. Um, and we always start with the data, not the AI. And then we build out one use case at a time for a given purpose. Because the biggest challenge with the executive level is if I go in there and say I want to build a data strategy, the first response is, well, where's the ROI in my data and the return? But then no one can tell you that unless it's aligned to a business strategy and you can prove it. So if you take it one use case at a time, which can be, depends how big the use case is, right? It can be four months, it can be a few months, it doesn't really matter. But ideally, you're finding the data that's being utilized the most based on that intent. Um, and in the background, you're moving data around to say, well, I don't need this, I do need this, I don't need this. It doesn't help that we've got seven-year seven archiving policies that says we have to keep data just in case. And none of that ever gets used. So you end up with a stockpile anyway. This way, we are saying, well, okay, there's a portion of it which has extrinsic value, because we can't, You've got to look at both values is where I'm going with this. The extrinsic value is what's the value to the regulator, what's the value to the outside world in terms of your customers and what they will pay for it. The intrinsic value may be so intrinsic that it has no benefit to the customer, but it keeps the business running. So you're almost compartmentalizing value in that way. So then you can actually start to understand which data is moving the dial in the business. But you do that piece by piece. Yeah. Now, um, when I think about all this kind of coming together, uh, this happens already. My research says that there's about a billion dollars already uh, in data transactions, people buying and selling data. I, I looked at that from just like looking at Web2 hyperscalers primarily. It's AWS, Google, IBM, Oracle, a lot of the known players. But that's very siloed. So how do you think, you know, again, you, the whole point of decentralization is to break down silos, make it more democratized. And I think a lot of what's prohibiting people from participating at a larger scale is just comfort that their data can be put out there into an open marketplace, be protected, mm. and they can have controls over it. How important is that to the data, like for people, people's participation? And then maybe perhaps what's your views on why decentralization is important in, that, in that, this ongoing marketplace? So part of the thesis in the book and the stuff I'm working with regulators on around the world is it's time to move away from privacy to ownership and choice. Because privacy's never worked, ever. Um, evidence proves it. Um, actually, if you have the right technologies to protect people, they then have the choice to be how open they want to be. For this to actually work is more than just decentralized storage. If we want AI to be as good as we think it will be, it needs diverse data that's unique to you as a human being. Because who you were yesterday is not who you are today. An AI is being recorded on yesterday. 
I need it running on real time that knows me. And the only way that's ever gonna work is if it's running on my data that I own that's up to date. And that will change the game then in terms of what AI will become, um, rather than necessarily based on yesterday's data and what that will be. So the ownership thing is massively important, not just for decentralization, but also for how AI will move forward. Because otherwise, we will create a, almost like a, a false reality of the world. Because I don't think people realize there are so many gaps in data in the internet that people haven't really thought about. For example? I'm glad you asked. All right. <laughs> not that I teed him up for anything, right? <laughs> um, so since 1991 and 1995, the internet was not archived. It only had archiving five years after its creation. So the internet doesn't exist between 1991 and 1995. From 2018 and 2009, the top 12 websites don't exist anymore. So if you add all of them up, it's about 30,000 petabytes, which is the equivalent of me going outside the New York Library and pressing delete, and deleting the entire New York Library. So I don't think what people realize is when I say data is memories and stories, data is our new cultural artifact, right? And we are deleting culture, because we're recycling data constantly rather than building on it Going back to intrinsic value, it sometimes doesn't have to be monetary. In the UK, when they were trying to piece together COVID in the National Archives, it became almost impossible because data was being deleted and recycled constantly. 14 million people a year go and see the pyramids in Egypt. Why? Because they're looking at stories from the past. Our new stories in 2024 is data, and we have to treat it as an asset, not as something that's valued financially, but something we need to hand down to generations of our stories. Right, so when you see a transaction in a debit card, to you, that's a transaction, that's someone's memory when they made the payment. So we have to join those dots. Well, I would say, if I were to guess on why this data is being deleted and not additive, it's because they're looking at their AWS bill. Hmm. It's like, well, I can't pay for all this. I just want to keep you know, the most current snapshot. Obviously, Filecoin is trying to put a dent in that narrative and that you have other alternatives. But that's, that's what's going on across the world on why it's not additive. Yep. So how do you begin to change the mindset on, no, I want this to be additive, mm. and I'm willing to pay the cost? And like, part of the value conversation is like there's a benefit and a cost. Yeah. So, so the reason for writing the book, and it's, you know, I'm here in an event the next couple of days, and it's so enthusing because it feels like I'm writing the underlying thesis that would make this all work, right? And when people think data is an asset, they think tokens, right? They think tokens, well, it's not. Actually, that's just a thing I'm gonna move around. To make it an actual asset, you have to treat it like water and electricity, which is effectively what I'm doing. I'm working with governments to make that possible. Because then everything you're describing happens by default. Because a nation treats its data like a national treasure, like an asset. And everything you're saying goes away because now it becomes valued. People get educated on it, how to read it, critical thinking increases, which by the way have been decreasing since 2018. Um, I think last year Microsoft proved that people have the tension span now of less than a goldfish. Right, so the last two years of cybersecurity um, impacts were because of human error. So if we carry on the trajectory of software is driving the bus and AI, what we'll end up with is a children in the next generation born into AI who can't read data or just accept what they see. So if you treat data as an actual asset, which is the cornerstone of a nation and its people, all of a sudden then all the things we're talking about of decentralized technology just happen by, de by design because you create an ecosystem where it can flourish rather than trying to play. I always make the case that the goal of the book and what I'm trying to do is not change the rules of the game, is to make data part of the game. Because if I do that, then it gets appreciated and all these technologies become true. All right, we're gonna take a moment and double click on a couple of statements you just made. Because like I'm sitting here and I've paid attention to data, data value for close to a year now. The audience, like I think they want to believe you, but they need to make it real. So we need to hit them in the face so they, can't, they, they intimately understand what you say where data needs to be viewed as a water, like water, like a utility. Help explain in your point of view what, how to conceptualize that so they can move forward. So Data's got to the point where it's almost as vital as water is every day. So if you uh, give you an idea, every single being alive, every second in this room creates 1.7 meg of data, right? So you saw Heath's charts earlier. That's if you add all that up, when you get to 90 years of age for the whole globe, that's about 65 million football stadiums worth of data. So it's becoming so critical to everyday life, it almost is like water, but with a difference. So water, electricity, and gas are finite. Data is infinite. 
Um, that's the real thing we have to bear in mind here because, and that's why it's so been so hard to value. We talk about the data economy, but all you're really measuring is the market cap increase of a company in a period because I could start the day with a piece of data that looks like that, but at the end of the day, that data is about that big because it's been built on top of data. So now what's the value of that versus that versus that? So it's infinite. So the reason we compare it to water and electricity is because it's becoming like a critical service. Think of it as you, you wouldn't be, if you didn't know where you were going home, you'd use Google Maps. If Google Maps didn't exist and there was no data, you couldn't get home. That's the generation of today. My generation will probably figure it out and I'd probably get lost really badly and use my hands and shout. But the generations today will be lost because all they've ever grown up into a world is everything is efficient and simple. So that's why that message is so important because you have to start looking at data as almost part of everyday life like water. But actually it has more intrinsic value ironically um, to each of us in this room because we all use it in different ways. The sad part is we've all missed out on its potential because of actually the way we've looked at it. We could have done so much in history that we haven't today yet. Well, and therein lies the opportunity. Correct. I think my premise is that I think data is going to be the largest, the third largest digital asset over the next 10 years. That puts it right behind Bitcoin and stable coins. I say it will reach on um, parity with stable coins. USDC is about $170 billion. Now, that's just the monetary value. So much of what we're just talking about is the intrinsic value that is frankly never going to be monetarily valued. And like, what's that number? It's, it's probably 80% of the worth. And that's why, like, this is why I've, I've caught on to this narrative as part of Filecoin, because Filecoin is humanity, storing humanity's data. Mm -hmm. And some of it will be monetary, some of it will be intrinsic. Of which, but you need, especially with, like, the monetary part, it's very easy to see that you need immutability and verification, or else that data has no value in an open economy. So, if, you know, like, when I first joined Filecoin, I'd have conversations with my friends and colleagues from Web2, and they would say to me, Porter, why do you need continuous proofs? It's archive storage. Once a month should be plenty. And at first I thought, okay, that makes sense. It's probably a little excessive. But now, as I've like spent more time thinking about data and its value, no, you need continuous proofs. Because if something is going, like for the 20% that's going to be transacted mm -hmm. and exchanged, you need continuous, ver continuous proofs to verify from a quality assurance perspective that the data is in its original state, immutable, verifiable. It's more than that, actually. So it's also where it came from, right? So yep. you have to remember that in a few years' time, your customer will be a machine, right, if you're a business. So your customer will be a machine. The machine will be the transaction decision maker. The machine will make the purchase. The person who raised the intent is a human. The person who receives the outcome is a human. But at the end of the day, when the machine goes off and makes a decision and some data comes back to me, how do I know that came from a real source? If I'm moving medical data around, how do I even know that person had diabetes I'm sharing data with? Was that fabricated, synthetically created? And can I even rate that? And can I even confirm that's real? So you, you have to have the things you're talking about. I think the other thing is, is the clear separation between extrinsic and extrinsic. Because intrinsic is just what it means to you. It's, it's your heritage, it has uniform, it's not like this industrial revolution where everything was scale and uniformity. This is unique to you, right? your life, your stories, whatever. The extrinsic value then is ultimately what is worth to the outside world, which data is a bit weird because it's everything and nothing at exactly the same time. I can go in one environment, it's worthless, I can go in a different environment, it's worth millions of dollars because it's scarcity in that environment. And the extrinsic value is, yes, yeah, so I look at it as a very unique asset because I look at it as the, the, almost like the brother and sister of Bitcoin and Ethereum because it's both of them, right? It's a store of value and it's a utility at exactly the same time. And I think that's what people miss, is that a lot of things I've seen today is some of its utility and some of its store of value. And it will, he, it will have intrinsic value to two different audiences, which is the cool thing. Yeah. So we're sitting here on the precipice of an industry, a movement that could be well worth over a trillion dollars in a short amount of time. What do you tell people who are interested in getting started? I think the first of all is, it depends where you're starting from, right? And where your of position course. is. If you're starting from software and you want to enable it, I think this is probably one of the biggest opportunities of a lifetime. Because actually what we're doing is we're unwinding a lot of the narrative around technology that has existed since probably the internet. To now actually go back to older values, which made sense, because they didn't make sense post the industrial revolution, right? They didn't really work in a digital era. But now, if you bring those values into the economy now, it makes sense. So if you're a software company, 
is a massive opportunity. And even if you're an existing incumbent, massive opportunity to, to get involved in data and helping people and managing it. Yeah, and I talk a lot about that in the book in some of the companies that will emerge and so on. So there's, and we talked a lot about this last time, I did on, on Real Vision as well. If you were an investor, you'd be, invest, you'd be investing in the enabling of this infrastructure, right? Because that's where the gold is as an investor. Um, if you're a consumer, I think it's start to understand your data more, where it goes. What it, but more importantly, ask yourself the most important question of all, what does this mean to me? Um, and what does it mean to the people behind me, like the photographs and everything you want to hand down? So I think there's something for everyone. Yeah, and I think, you know, on the individual basis, I think people are already making that decision. And I think it starts with just opting out of Facebook and in Instagram. And they do so because I, I think part of that reason is because they know their behaviors are being monetized without, well, it's with their consent, but it's not, it's not a fair exchange. So my argument is if we have it as an asset, they become even more profitable. All right, that's an interesting point. Right because they get data they've never seen before in their life, right? Because they're running in silos. Apple only knows my Apple life. It doesn't know what I watch on Amazon TV. It doesn't know what I watch on Netflix. But what if I could connect all of that data? Because I own it. And all of a sudden, now Apple, a really big company, could become even bigger. Because now I trust them, and they have high quality, and they get more access to data they've never seen in their lives. You see, the issue with ownership in the past and why it's completely failed is because we took on big tech in the same way uh, they take on us, which is just a, it's a monetary conversation. It's not about that. Because what data really is, and I've never said this publicly, is potential. Ooh. Right? Potential to do amazing things. Even for big tech, the individuals, even an economy. And if you get it right, then everybody wins. You this should is, write that down. I should write that down, really. <laughs> um, but that's the point, right? Is that we've, we've looked at it as, and we've created a nation of fear because everybody fears sharing. So if you're, a th if you're an incumbent, it's, it's incredibly hard because you want to deliver personalization, you want to deliver good service, but there's a narrative of fear. So when it becomes an asset, all of this changes because the conversation is different. And it's these building blocks and some of these things I'm not talking about in depth is what's in the book and why I'm working with governments to try and change this narrative because it adds value to everyone. All right, Michael, you are a self-proclaimed futurist. I wouldn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> How does this play out? So I think, look, if it goes on the trajectory, I think it is. Um, oh, what can I mention stuff? OK. So I think today, I think the way AI is being built is completely incorrect. Um, I think the future and China have already shown the way in terms of modular AI. So I think you'll eventually have your own modular AI on your device based on domains of interest. Um, I think once you own your own, your own data, we'll see a, a spike in the economy. You'll see increased in trusts, and you'll see new businesses emerge. Um, that's where I see the future going. I see this as actually probably one of our biggest catalyst decisions we have to make as an economy and as a group of people, because if we get this right, we lay the foundations probably for the future of technology, but also the future of how we will interact on a daily basis. So I'm super excited by it because I think there's such a negative press with AI. If we use AI the right way and focus on the right things, AI will be even better than people are talking about today. So it sounds like, if I were to read you correctly, you're a proponent of bring your own AI. I say that in a comparison to bring your own device to work. Um, is, that, is that consistent? 100%, so we write about that in the book. Um, it, it has to be, right? Because it, how, how every human being is unique by definition. So how can you apply a generic narrative to data to a population that sees the world very differently? We already know that all of us don't see that screen the same way. And the colors are different. So you can't apply common thinking to someone, particularly if you're trying to help someone with their health in the future using AI. The only way you're going to do that successfully is to use that person's data to know about them intrinsically and maybe use other people's data that have tried something different to inform that. So I am probably the most optimistic person with AI, but using the right assets in the right way, it will become incredibly powerful. Yeah, and this isn't so much in the future as people think. No. We, we already have, at least in the Filecoin ecosystem, there's Ghost Drive, which is a generative AI platform built natively on top of Filecoin that will take your data and give you gen AI capabilities. A lot of it's like just image creation or file generation. Maybe you need to write a blog pat on, on past uh, documents you've created. Like That's already out there today, and you can store it natively on Filecoin through this platform. So like this isn't so much in the future. No. But people are just, these tools and platforms are just being built today 
and they're just being explored by you know uh, this entry like early adopter base of users. Yeah. Now you you've mentioned the book a couple times. You got to tell the our audience what to expect about the book. What's it called? When is it going to be released? So you and, and I have bounced this title off so many times. Just flip flopped. Like LinkedIn must hate me because I've changed the title so many times. I decided just to own it, right? And so the book is called Data Revolution, The Rise of an Asset. Um, and it was written for two people. So the first part, first part is the history lesson of data, but not the vast history lesson, because cleverer people than me are about to write those books. I'm going to show you the milestones in history and how data changed. That part of the book is a voice for the generation to demand change. The second part of the book is the guidebook for those who must change. So I will actually show you how to make data an actual asset. Um, right down to the regulation and everything that goes with it. Uh, the third part of the book then is all the use cases that are now possible. So data is a financial asset, health, etc. And then, then I talk about possible futures, but then almost what is the eight, nine point plan for the regulator to start? And how does it become an actual asset? Because a token is just literally 0.1% of it. Um, there is a bigger picture that you have to draw out. And that requires, if I want to give you something in your life, I have to work backwards from there and go right to the people that I need to do to make that happen, which is what I'm doing. So yeah, the hope is 2025 that will come out as a book, but the reality is the world isn't stopping. So I'm continually working with governments and others and trying to work with the right people. So then when the book comes out, that's just a, a reference point rather than the start of the story. The hardest part for any artist is when to stop. Yeah. <laughs> that's what my publisher says. What, <laughs> I what is your favorite use case within the book? Um, which one do I give away? Teaser. This is what they call a teaser. <laughs> All right. This is an obvious one, so I won't give away the goodies. Um, the obvious one is a digital twin at birth. Go That's on. That's the obvious one. So my parents inherit my data to me um, when I'm born, and I combine that with my data at birth, and I do A-B testing on my own data using a digital twin. So basically, my parents would hand down 75 years of data. I'm born with diabetes. My dad had diabetes. I can see the generic genomes. I can see everything. And I plump it on top of my data and run a digital twin. And then I A-B test in real time what medication would be right for me using my own data, which I would be able to do because now I'd have a single connection of all my data. And it wouldn't be siloed because I don't know. Did you know in the US that they only store your medical records for seven years? That doesn't surprise me. And think about it. If you had cancer eight years ago, you go to a new doctor, not in your medical file. Mm. And it seems ludicrous, or just when you go across different health systems, because these are all like massive networks, and if you go from one network to network, there's a reason why they make you do all the tests again. Yeah. Because they don't trust what the other provider did. So they run all the same tests. We're like, oh, we just need to make sure and see it for our own eyes. But you're also forgetting that data privacy is also the hindrance in that role, particularly with the US of with course. HIPAA. So HIPAA is actually a hindrance because as you move across state, and because the state laws are different for data regulation, in the end, the patient is the one that suffers. So actually, if ownership was a thing, you would then be able to decide. There's also many stories of people who've been unconscious and they've almost died because the, the people doing the, the healthcare in the right way didn't have access to the allergies. Again, I could make that decision and share that with anybody in advance under those conditions, and suddenly the world's a bit different, right? So that's why you have to look at data beyond, I'm gonna make a quick buck from it, and I'm gonna make $5. It actually has the potential to do so much more. Yeah, and that particular example, it makes me want to take control of my medical records. I can have a medical wallet where, you know, let's say I'm in Thailand and I have an emergency, I have what I need to have ready to go so I can get the best possible medical care in a tricky situation. That to me just makes so much sense because it's life and death. Yep. And like that's why I want to own and control my own data. Uh, you know, I started this, this conversation with why. <laughs> and you're, you're gonna go ECC, there's so many people talking about the what and the how within Web3. And the, the big question is why. Uh, and that's what I, I am so excited about, the data, you know, the data economy, the data revolution, because I think Pro Filecoin has a very particular role to play in this coming future. And that's why I'm so excited to like, get Michael on stage, hear about his thoughts. He is a thought leader in this space. And trust me when I say the more you dive into Michael's work, the more excited and enthusiastic you will get about one of the greatest 20 to 30 year opportunities in all of technology right now. 
uh, that you will hear very, you know, pockets of discussion around ECC, but it is what is not being said. It's the rise of the data revolution uh, and the people who are really the visionaries in technology and in Web3 at the space are focused on, the, on that outcome. So with that, thank you, Michael, as always. Look for it. Please read his book, January or early 2025. Data, the right way. Data, the rise of, of an the asset. That's your, that's your fault. What's that? Data revolution, the rise of an asset. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you all. Cool.